Eh, bueno, buenos días. Eh, antes que nada, les damos la bienvenida a este segundo eh, día de eh, ponencias sobre el Congreso de Animalibus, la presencia zoológica en la literatura. Y bueno, para nosotras hoy es un placer y un privilegio contar con la presencia de la doctora Salima Ikram, que es la especialista a nivel mundial en momias, tanto eh, de uno, humanas como de otras especies. Entonces, bueno, eh, nos sentimos muy honradas. Gracias, doctora. Thank you, doctor Ikram, for this conference. And, bueno, ahora va, le voy a dar la palabra a Carla. Eh, Carla Dávalos, ella va a eh, hacernos eh, la traslación, nos va a interpretar porque esta conferencia magistral va a ser dictada en inglés. En, bueno, entonces, sin más, por favor, Carla, tú tienes la palabra. Hola, buenos días. Eh, procedo a dar la introducción de la breve semblanza de la doctora Salima Ikram. Eh, es breve porque su currículum en realidad es muy amplio, pero no podemos pasar tanto tiempo hablando de su currículum. Mejor vamos a darle después paso a su ponencia. <coughs> pues se las presento. La doctora Salima Ikram es profesora de Egiptología en la Universidad Americana en el Cairo. Ha participado en numerosos proyectos arqueológicos en Egipto, Turquía y Grecia. Recibió un doble título en Historia y Arqueología Clásica y de Medio Oriente por parte del Bryn Mawr College en Estados Unidos. Posteriormente realizó un doctorado en Arqueología Egipcia en la Universidad de Cambridge en Reino Unido. En 2013 recibió el Premio Investigación de la Sociedad Geográfica Española y desde el 2017 es miembro honorario de la Academia Estadounidense de las Artes y las Ciencias. <coughs> Actualmente dirige el proyecto de momias animales en el Museo Egipcio del Cairo el estudio del oasis Darbainamur al norte de Jarga, el proyecto Amenmeses, excavaciones en las tumbas KV-10 y KV-63 en el Valle de los Reyes y ha codirigido el proyecto de la Galería Predinástica. Ella es una experta de renombre que se ha dedicado a compartir su conocimiento en conferencias y clases alrededor de todo el mundo. Además, es autora de varios libros y artículos sobre egiptología, tanto para un público académico como para uno no especializado y también ha participado en más de 30 documentales internacionales. Eh, sin más por el momento, vamos a empezar. Doctor Salima Ikram, shall we start? Absolutely. Um, um, I'll, I have the screen share, right? Yes. Okay, give me one minute. Um, alors, having a bit of Technical, voila. Gracias a todos por la um, e invitación, por um, giving a lecture. Uh, I am very sorry that this is not in Spanish, and I hope that if there are any questions, we can address the issues and answer them very promptly. It is a great honor for me to be here, and I hope that you are having a wonderful conference. So, we know that the ancient Egyptians mummified humans, but they also mummified animals. A mummy is the preserved body that is artificially preserved of a human or an animal. So there has to be intervention and it is very deliberate. Animals were very important for the ancient Egyptians for many things. They were important for food, for clothing, um, for raw materials. They also inspired language and the gods. And they were so important that the ancient Egyptians often mummified them for different reasons. So the relationship between the human beings and the animals was very complex. From the mummified animals, we learn that there is a huge diversity of species. Um, and that ranges from beetles, to crocodiles with everything in between. Now, animal mummies were not always respected by the ancient Egyptians. 
um, I mean, sorry, by the modern Egyptians and in fact, modern people. Um, the modern Egyptians didn't seem to care much for them, but they would sometimes sell them um, as curiosities to tourists. They also sold them and they were taken to Europe and used as fertilizer for agriculture until people realized that these were cat mummies that had been crushed, spread on the fields, and then plants grew out of them. So people became very disgusted and they stopped this habit. Now, why do we study mummies, animal mummies in particular? Because of course, they were not worth much. People just threw them away. Um, they were only being used for uh, fertilizer. Now, from mummies, we can learn religious and cultural aspects of the life of the ancient Egyptians. They are very useful to tell us about climate and environment, and also the different species that were uh, in existed in Egypt and um, how they might have evolved or changed or moved away entirely. Um, we learn about veterinary practices, the Egyptians' understanding of technology, the um, trade and exchange routes, both based on the materials used for mummification, and also the import of animals. And all of this tells us about the economy. Now, there are different types of animal mummies. The first is something we can all understand. These are pets. The other are food, uh, because you can take it with you and enjoy it. The third type are, oops, sacred animals that are worshiped during their lifetime. The fourth type are votive offerings, and they also include um, false mummies, which I will talk about. And then when scholars don't know what to do, we put them under otro. They are Benedict, they are blessed by association, they can be guardians, they can be amulets, we don't know. <coughs> now, how do we study animal mummies and how do we learn about how they were made? The first thing to do is to look at the mummies themselves and have a visual examination. We also use radiography, CT scans. We can analyze the materials of embalming. And all of this gives us information about how the mummies were made, technology, and also about um, the, the trade and exchange. Sometimes we think by looking at a mummy, we can see if there is change over time, or maybe there are variations based on geography. However, now that I am studying more mummies, I don't think it is that easy to use the patterns of bandaging to give us this information. So here you can see basic radiography, x-rays, measurements, more x-rays, sometimes we have very big animals. This is a toro, the Smithsonian Museo di Natural, Historia Naturale. Um, and this is the x-ray. And you see, esto es more than one animal. So this is a composite mummy. So already when we look at this, we realize that this gives you one idea, but this shows you a completely different picture. So the head is real, but here we have legs, 
And here we have ribs. And further along, there's another small head. So this is more than one mummy. CT scans are very useful also, and this was um, CT'd. Um, CT scans now, you can unwrap virtually, so it's excellent. You do not destroy anything. Um, here are a series of cat mummies, you can see. This is the cat, this is how you look at it radiographically, and then with the CT, so it gives you a fresh insight. Um, how were the mummies made? Um, we have evisceration with the internal organs removed. We do not have excerebration because most animal brains are small, so it does not matter. And even with humans, not everyone was excerebrated. We can put them into natrun, which is a naturally occurring salt, like salt and baking soda. It makes, it takes away the, the liquid and it also takes away the fat. So very good for your diet. You then use oils and resins after it is dry and then you bandage and you wrap the mummy and you pray over it. And then, bravo, you have a mummy. We can learn more about um, mummification by looking at um, mummification houses and the areas associated with mummification and their um, dedication. This is in Memphis where we think that some of the mummification took place of the uh, Toro Apis. This is Duna El Jebel where we have um, the consecration of mummies before they were put into the um, catacombs. Also, we think maybe you can not do evisceration and with some of the birds, they were dried, desiccated, and then bloop, put into oils and resins. We have learned about mummification by doing experimental archaeology, where you can see that uh, this was our control. Did not, we did not take out the internal organs and so it exploded. This one, we took out the internal organs and quite dramatically, it was successful. Um, we have other ones with the internal organs removed. You can see that these are natrun bags. This is the end where we put resin on. Then we are wrapping with the bandages. And one thing we learned by doing a big animal is you need many people. So with a bull or a cow, you need teams of workers. Otherwise, you cannot manage. Think of taking out the stomach. For a cow, there are four stomachs. So very big, very difficult, very complicated. <clears throat> we have from Armand, the Madre de Bucis. Bucis is a sacred cow, Toro um, Sacre. When they found them, they reconstructed to see this is what they look like. Very beautiful. They also found these things that look like they are for oil, acete. But they took this to England and it was on display and a veterinario looked at this. The veterinario said, ah, oh, esto es por an enema for animales grandes. So Herodotus has written that um, there is a cheap way, a quick way of mummification using an, oop, an enema. And so if you use an enema 
of the Assetti di Cedre, como turpentine, it works well. Many Egyptologists said, no, 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 no. Pero we did an experiment, trabaja experimentar, y uh, Peter Cottontail, esto muy bien, esto molto facile, no, uh, no sangre, no nothing, no uh, nada. So we made this and the only time that there is a bad smell is at the end. You put the little enema and then you leave it in natron for three weeks. You take it out and you do this. Everything is soft. So you went squish and it all comes out. But be careful, do not stand behind it because it's really smelly. So it works. So here we have the experimental mummies and we have given many proper burials. Some of them I keep in my office. You can visitar. They like uh, of France, the uh, carrots, uh, chocolate, gin. <laughs> and you can see they are quite happy. So now <clears throat> I will tell you about the different types of animal mummies. First, the companions. Everyone or many people have pets. You love your pets. When you die, you want your pets to be with you. So either the pet dies first and gets mummified or you die and later on the pet is buried in your courtyard. We have an example of a gato, the uh, Prince Tutmos, and this is from uh, Memphis. And it is very nice because you have the um, uh, sarcophage and here you have the cat with the offrand and here is the cat and it's as a mummy. So it is exactly buried how you would have a human being buried. <clears throat> from Abydos, we found this man from uh, the uh, Epoch Ptolemaico, uh, Hapimin, and here at his feet, there was a small bundle which had his perro, y pequeño perro. Es uh, como le um, caballeros, caballeros, uh, who had the knights who have their dogs with them. But happy men, he had his real dog here. So they were together forever. Um, this is another man who the coffin was empty, but we know he loved his dog because there are pictures of the dog on the coffin and the name. So probably they were buried together. In the <clears throat> Valle de Reinos, the Valley of the Kings, we have three or four tombs that are solo por el animales. And these, one of them contained this monkey and this dog. And they were found, they were robbed. So the bandages have been taken. This has some bandages and they were like this. So the dog, the, and the monkey was very sad, muy tristo, and the dog was saying, no, no, it is better in the afterlife. We think that these are maybe um, pets belonging to King um, Amenhotep II, or maybe um, possibly uh, Horemheb, because of the location of these tombs. From much later, from the 26th dynasty, about uh, 600 avante Cristo, we have a coffin with, it had a horse in it. So we know that even horses were buried um, and they were regarded as very important pets. 
there is a very interesting story about the priestess, Makare. She was found with the other royal mummies and um, with her in the same coffin, the mismo sarcophage, there was this bundle. And everyone said, esto es un bebe, bebe. So many of the Egyptologists said, ah, oh, she was a priestess, terrible. She should not have had a baby. She, this is a bad thing. Maybe she was killed. Maybe someone did something because she broke her vows, blah, 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 blah. So for 100 years, almost, they said this. Then they were doing a project of radiographia de momias royales, uh, reyes, and there was one film left. And they said, what do we do? And they said, ah, baby. So they x-rayed the baby. Esto no es un baby. Se esto en mono. So she was buried with her pet monkey. So after 100 years, now people can say only good things about Makare. Um, we have baboon mummies from the Valley of the Kings and other places. Baboons are not from Egypt. Baboons are imported from Africa. So this is an uh, animal exotica for los Egyptians. Um, so here, interesting, you see there is no big tooth. Huh? They took it out so the animal couldn't bite. So you would keep this as a pet so it would not bite. We have some examples of baboons con canino. These are used as guards for the policia. And we have pictures on the, the muras, murales de tumbas that show the uh, baboons running after thieves and biting them. So they were used as guardians. <clears throat> a colleague and I and a group, we have been studying to see where the baboons might come from. And we think that they come maybe from here in the area of Ethiopia and Eritrea. So we know that early on there was a trade in exotic animals. The next kind of animal mummy is the food mummy, which the Egyptians, they liked to uh, comida, comer. And so we have meat. Tutankhamun had um, 60 boxes, more than 60 boxes of food. And uh, his grand, Great grandparents, Yuya and Tuya, also had many meats. These foods have small, um, the coffin, small coffins in the forma, the animales. E, um, here we have the mummy of ducks, geese, pigeons, and meat. No pollo, no pollo in Egipto. Ancien. So they prepare them as if they are roasted, so you can eat them directly. But they take out the liver and the gizzards, and then they wrap them up and put them back in. You can see these are ribs, gotes, costas. So barbecued is invented in ancient Egypt. We have done some tests 
on the materia negro. Huh? And we find this materia negro is resin of a terebinth, terebinth. This comes from Lebanon. So we have, again, trade for the materials coming from very far away. Also, there are recipes nowadays where you use resin of the terebinth in your cooking. So maybe this was not just for mummification, but also for the flavor. <clears throat> we have cemeteries for animal mummies going all through Egypt with many, many different species. Now, the sacred animals, the idea is that the gods are associated with special animals. One animal is sometimes chosen and you recognize it by the markings. It has, you know, a star on the forehead or a big mane or something. The spirit of the god enters the body of the animal. During the life of that animal, it is the god on earth. After its death, it is mummified. The spirit of the god moves to the body of a different animal with similar markings that the priests recognize. So the same spirit moves and moves and moves, just like the Dalai Lama. Esto el mismo. El principal es el mismo. So we have many cults of animals, especially the bulls, the toro. We have apis bulls, manavis bulls, bucus bulls. They are buried in um, the Serapium, Labyrinthos. And you can see here many, many kilometers. And there are the stili, votos, ex votos, and the sarcophage. Todos son vidos. They were all empty, except for one. <clears throat> we are hoping that maybe we will find a place where they have not been robbed. This is a example like you saw earlier, and we thought it would be one animal, but it was many animals. We have um, sacred rams belonging to the god Hnu. And you can see with the radiograph, it's very old, no teeth, gone. So you have to feed this with mush. So you had to look after it. So they lived for a long time. There are also amuleti, amulets, so that he is very carefully mummified. One of my favorite mummies are the crocodilios. And here we have two big crocodiles. And when I was cleaning, I put my hand in the mouth and I thought, there's a stick. But no, I took it out and it was a baby crocodilio, this big. Because the mothers carry the babies in their mouths. And also it looks like they open and they come out and it is birth again. The crocodile is like the sun god and is a symbol and, and fertility of the Nile. So it is symbol of birth, rebirth, and resurrection. Now, the question is, the crocodile god is Sobek, male. So it is strange that the crocodiles put 
the babies in their mouth if these are supposed to be male crocodiles? So this is a bit of a question. We are trying to do DNA to see if crocodiles are male or female. So when Napoleon went to Egypt, he took many savants with him. One of them was Geoffrey Saint-Hilaire, who studied natural history and he studied crocodile mummies. He thought he identified two types of crocodiles in the Nile, Sucus and Niloticus. Everyone said, no, only Niloticus, solo Niloticus. So no one talked to him. They said in the Nile, Niloticus, West Africa, Sucus. Then in 2011, Yvonne Hekela and her team did DNA. And they found that in Egypt, they have Sucus and Niloticus, two species. How did they get there? Now, solo, solo Niloticus. So were they imported like the baboons or were there two species in the Nile? And then the sucus, because of the mummification, became extinct. And the crocodile niloticus exists. So Ivan and I are now studying this. We have been just now doing DNA samples from these crocodiles. This is Ivan um, in uh, the Peabody Museum. The majority of mummies that we have from animals are votive offerings. They are the same idea as a candle in the church. The prayer goes to God. But the Egyptians liked things for the long term. The candle finishes, but the mummy, which is a sacrificio di sangue, sang, sangre, blood sacrifice, is a bigger present than a candle or a statue, and it is forever. So it is very, it is a big gift to the gods. So the majority of mummies that we have are um, <clears throat> offerings. And this we have all kinds, depending on which god. So we have dogs for Anubis and Wepwawit, we have scarabs for the sun god Ra. We have catfish, who knows? We have many rap rapaz, and they are for the sun god. Um, we have ibis and baboons for Thoth. And here again, you can see that even for the ones that are offerings, there are um, labyrinthos to bury them in. And you can see very big, complicated places. And you go in and here we have the ibis birds, one in each jar. <clears throat> Sometimes they are not in jars, they are lying around here. Sometimes the tombs are not special. They are reused tombs of humans. And this is uh, Jose Galan from our work in um, Thebes. And there is an inscription here. And this gives the date of Ptolemy V. So we know when this was made and sealed. Um, sometimes when you see this, jar, it's like an egg, it's over, and inside is the bird. So we have the symbolism of the egg, the ova, which was also like the sun disk, and then the idea of the egg for rebirth and resurrection, which you see also in Christianity. 
um, we have been looking at ibis mummies to try and see if they were um, bred specially um, or whether they were just captured wild and we are still not sure. Some of the animals were killed deliberately because it was a sacrifice. So it's a sacrificio. So you can see here, they broke the neck of the cat and many of the animals have their heads bashed in to kill them. So it is violent. It is not always nice, but it is a sacrifice. And the idea is that this animal, once it's mummified, will live forever with the god. Looking at cat mummies, different groups have tried to understand the origins of the domestication of the cat. Now they think that maybe it was in the Near East, but the cat came to Egypt and from Egypt, it went everywhere because of the trade routes. Because we know that the ships have cats against the rats. Um, we have many beautiful cat coffins you can see here. And inside there's a small over here, a kitten. They are wrapped in many ways. You can see that little face there, cute. <clears throat> Um, we have birds, as I said, because these are rapasts, sacred to the Dios du Sol, Ray. This one is very interesting. It was CT scanned, and we found inside that it had not been eviscerated. And here is a tail. It ate and ate and ate, and generally they go, Ugh. This didn't go, they kept giving it food. And so it died because it ate too much. But you can identify that it ate a small bird, it ate a mouse, and one mouse's tail stuck. <clears throat> we also have the musareñas. And these are sacred to the Dio de Sol, Ray. And so these musareñas is a big packet. And now uh, my friend Neil and I, he is an expert in musareñas. And we are learning that there are many different species that now do not exist in Egypt. So we are trying to see now, when did they become extinct? They also tell us how the climate has changed because many of the musareñas like it to be um, humid and wet. So either they were all living by the Nile or there were more places with trees that they could live. So we are now investigating the different environments based on the animal mummies. This is a very nice musarenia. It's beautiful, cute. Um, you also see them with their own sarcophage, and they are dore, because, of course, they are the sun. We have many dogs, and now we are learning about different dog breeds. Um, and this is a small Maltese dog, which maybe came from the time of the Romans. <clears throat> you look at this crocodilio, his head is there, the tail is there. This is the tail. Here's a head, here's another head. So they put two crocodiles and they wrapped it up. And maybe because they were going la la la, talking to their friends, they didn't notice. We also have the false mummies. Now, maybe these are, if you are cynic, you will say that the priests were trying to cheat people. But if you are not cynical, you can say for the Egyptians, if you say something is real, 
and even a part of that thing is there and you say the words, it becomes real. So it is not really false. So we have many mummies that have um, sometimes mud, but sometimes feathers or one bone, and they are wrapped up to look like the mummy of something. And there is a group of these mummies um, and you can interpret them in different ways. And it is not just mummies of um, animals that are rare. These are mummies of animals that you find all the time. So this beautiful wrapping from the ibis catacomb, but it contains eggs of the ibis. So you think, think of all of this mummification. We have um, ibises, we have, you know, six million in one place. Dogs, eight million. There are a huge number of these animals and animal mummies. And so they really, really um, were a big business. Because think of it, you have to sometimes import the animals, then you have to look after the animals. So they are priests or people specialized in feeding them, cleaning their cages, um, grooming them. And then you have all the people who are producing the food. Then you have the people who are getting the mummification materials. So whether you are using alum, natron, resin that is imported, linen bandages, all of this must be gathered together, plus the people who work for them. So this is a large part of the economy because if you think eight million dogs over 200 years, it's a lot of dogs. And then what happens is pilgrims would come to the temple and they would want to buy the ex votos as offerings. So they would be maybe twice a year there would be a big fiesta for this. Um, now think of the fiestas you have in the churches now in Mexico or anywhere. People come, thousands of people come, but then there are the shops, there are the hotels, there are the restaurants, there are the people selling little, little things. There are the thieves. They are the people who are doing the musicians, the entertainers. So this becomes a big business for the whole community. So when you think of animal mummies, it is not just the thought of people's relationship with animals, whether they are food, whether they are pets, whether they are gods, but it is also a large part of everyone's daily life and survival in the way of whether it's emotional survival or economic survival. So animal mummies and mummification really goes beyond what the mummy is itself. It is a part of a bigger picture that helps us to understand ancient Egypt and the Egyptians. So by looking at these animal mummies, we are looking at an entire culture an environment and a history through a different lens. And as technology advances and we, our own understanding improves, we can understand an increasing amount about the ancient Egyptians and ancient Egypt, as well as human animal interactions by looking at animal mummies. So thank you very much. If you have any questions, I am very happy to answer them or talk more about any special aspect. Eh, si alguien tiene una pregunta, la doctora puede regresar y retomar ese tema. Bueno, yo me quedé maravillada y si tengo una pregunta para la doctora. Eh, a mí me interesa sobre todo eh, el escarabajo pelotero que significaba la eternidad. Ella ha encontrado algún eh, Beatle de cómo lo, si lo ha encontrado insectos y en especial este eh, escarabajo. 
Sochil <clears throat> is interested on the poop bit. I don't know how it is called. Scarabs. Yeah, and um, if you had found it, um, what about it? So the scarabs, as you know, are these beetles, yeah? And the beetles actually roll these balls of dung, which they take for the babies to eat. Now, for the ancient Egyptians, they thought when you see the scarab rolling the ball of dung, it looks like the sun is being moved. So the scarab was associated with the sun god. And because the Egyptians didn't quite understand what was going on, they thought that the um, babies came out of this ball. So again, it was the idea of birth and generation, which is why the scarab beetle is a charm associated with the rising sun and is the god of the first, the sunrise. Eh, estos escarabajos, eh, se les, los egipcios veían que llevaban estas bolas de popó y se las daban a los bebés para que se las eh, comieran. Y esto los egipcios lo veían, lo relacionaban con el, el dios del sol, eh, pero sí, no entendían qué estaba pasando, así que ellos lo relacionaban con la regeneración, eh, con el sol naciente. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Josie, tengo una pregunta. Quisiera saber si ha encontrado momias animales embarazadas. I have a question. Have you ever found animal mummies pregnant? No, but most of them would have been eviscerated. So I think they would have taken the baby out. Um, no, I do not know of any pregnant animal mummy. No, no hay eh, momias embarazadas. Por lo general, le sacan las vísceras, así que no. There was one publication that came out of Poland that said there was an, a monkey that was pregnant. Hay una publica, se publicó... Eh, Except they were wrong. Pero se Because the mummy that they were publishing was based on my x-rays, but they could not see that that monkey had a penis. Ese estudio se basaba en unas momias que había visto la doctora Kram, pero se equivocaron porque no habían visto el pene del, mon del mono. So it could not be pregnant. Que no, no podía estar embarazada. Nice earrings, Carla. Oh, thank you very much. They, those are toucans. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also would like to know why did they kill cats so violently? Oh, not just cats, dogs too, and smaller crocodiles. I mean, because the big cats, how are you going to kill them? They might have poisoned some, I don't know. Le pregunté que por qué mataban a los gatos de manera tan violenta. Respondió que también a los perros y a los cocodrilos, pero no saben por qué, pero era, pues, no los podías controlar, entonces por eso los mataban de manera violenta. ¿Alguna otra pregunta que quieran hacer? Um, yo, yo sí, otra, otra pregunta tengo. Uh, nos habló de las momias, de, de creo que era un toro. Eh, ¿Qué huesos había en ese toro, en esa momia, momia compuesta? You talked about, I guess it was one of the first mummies, the a bull, I guess. It was a composite mummy. Yeah. What were those bones uh, like? Those were bull bones? Or? Yeah, they were all cow bones. They were all cattle. Oh, okay. Todos esos, esos huesos que había en esa momia eran de eh, otros dos. Eh, 
Eh, pues no hay más preguntas por el momento, entonces me parece que vamos a concluir. Y eh, Sorry, pues por favor entregar la constancia. Uh, we are about to finish. Um, we, are, we are about to finish, Dr. Ikram, so Sochi is about to tell you something. Bueno, Thank doctora, you. pues. Muchas gracias por compartir con nosotros su, su conocimiento tan amplio y de tantos años. En particular, yo estoy maravillada porque, bueno, eh, usted sabe que yo, eh, bueno, sigo su trabajo desde que era muy joven. Y, este, bueno, ahora le voy a dar lectura a la, eh, a la constancia de la doctora. Nada más déjenme comparto pantalla. Y, este, bueno, ténganme un poquito de paciencia porque... Este, um, no le sé mucho estas cuestiones. Ahí voy. Ya estoy compartiendo pantalla. ¿Sí? Ok. Um, eh, la Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana es Unidad de Iztapalapa. El programa de maestría y doctorado en Humanidades otorga la presente constancia a la doctora Salima Ikram por haber participado en la conferencia A Soul for Eternity, Animal from Mommy, from Ancient Egypt. En el marco del quinto congreso de Animalibus, la, conferencia, eh, la presencia zoológica en la literatura, que se llevó a cabo en la Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana los días 8, 9 y 10 de diciembre, casa abierta al tiempo. Y bueno, muchísimas gracias, doctora, por compartir con usted. Eh, ah, creo que me estoy presentando, perdón. Estoy presentando otra cosa. Eh, ah, ok, bueno. Eh, ¿sí, ¿Sí vieron la, 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 la constancia de la doctora? Ok, bueno, pues Carla, por favor, extiéndele mi... Eh, ¿Serías, eh, podrías eh, traducir, por favor? Uh, Sochi wants to thank you for accepting to participate in this conference, for being so, so kind with us. And she admires you a lot. You already know it. She has already told you. And here is your certificate for participating with your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. It has been a great honor and pleasure. I am sorry that I have not given you something in advance in, in Spanish, but for your publication, I will absolutely give in my paper. And I hope that you have a very successful rest of the conference. And it was wonderful. And I hope that I meet you all in person soon. La doctora está muy agradecida por eh, porque la hayamos invitado. Eh, también se disculpa por los inconvenientes que, un, que hubo, pero es, y espera encontrarnos pronto en persona. Bueno, pues no me resta más que agradecerles su presencia con esta eh, conferencia de lujo y bueno, los invitamos a las mesas de la tarde y eh, bueno, no nos, eh, no nos despedimos, nos vemos por la tarde y bueno, cuídense mucho. Doctora, bye, thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ikram. Thank you. thank you all very, very much. Bye, thank bye. You, thank you, doctor. Chao, thank you. Chao. 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 Ay, pues bueno, ya salió. Entonces. Eh... Hay, hay mesas en la mañana. Ay. Hay mesas a las once y media, queridas. Ah, ok, bueno. Pues ahí me equivoqué, lo siento. Este, um, ahorita, eh, bueno, es que estoy muy nerviosa, lo siento, lo siento. Entonces, um, pero bueno, ahorita va a entrar la gente. Lo siento, es el mejor. No te, no te...